Um, so I was given the topic uh, that we were going to talk about, um, we're going to have a discussion about freedom of conscience in medicine. And my first thought was that the problem I have with most discussions about freedom of conscience in medicine is that they aren't. They aren't usually discussions, and they're not usually about freedom of conscience in medicine. Um, so I want to unpack that a little bit for you uh, in terms of, of what I would recommend if you find yourself thinking, I, I, I might be in a discussion about freedom of conscience in medicine. I find it helpful to think of interactions along a continuum. At one end of the continuum is dictate, and then one moves to debate, and then one moves to discussion, and then one moves to dialogue. Uh, when you're on the dictate end of the con uh, continuum, one is merely dumping information. Uh, I don't really care much about you or what you think. My function is to dump information into you uh, because that's what we've decided we're going to do. A lot of medical school is dictate. Um, those who organize sessions like this stand up for two or three minutes uh, and dictate uh, and tell us how things are going to be and uh, it's quite irrelevant what we think. Uh, this is how things are. Uh, it's a very efficient way of conveying information. There's no relational content. Uh, and if the problem is ignorance, then it usually solves the problem uh, if the other person acknowledges that the problem is ignorance. Then you move to debate. And this discussion is replacing debate. And when I suggested debate, a few people thought, oh, isn't, isn't that a little bit contra you know, confrontational? And I thought, no, actually, it might be an improvement since when one moves into debate, you at least pay attention to the other person's argument for the purpose of proving them wrong. Um, right? And that's why you enter into the debate. So you have a position which you are defending, um, it, but you pay attention to what the other person is saying because it's important to figure out where they're in error so you can show them where they're in error um, so that now they're, uh, they can go on the correct direction. The problem is not, is, might be ignorance, but also is, is error and that you wish to correct. Moving into discussion, uh, you actually pay attention to the other person's arguments because there might be something good in it that you might choose to adapt. Um, and so you're paying attention to what they say uh, so that you can improve your, your own understanding. Uh, but the point is to understand their point of view uh, because there might be some utility in understanding their point of view. The point of dialogue is I'd like to get to know you. Uh, what motivates you? What are, where are your fears coming from? So I'm paying attention to the truth claims you make, um, not so much because that's what I want to engage with, but because I want to engage with you and where you're coming from. That is the most inefficient way to exchange information. Uh, it's terribly inefficient, but the relational content is extremely high. And if the problem is a motivational problem, um, or if you have a different understanding of what you've actually come to talk about, that can actually be a far more effective way to change someone's choices and what they're going to do next. So I find it very helpful when, I'm in, when someone, a colleague brings a topic up to try to get a sense fairly quickly of what they're looking to do. And if they're looking to dictate, then I usually smile and nod and allow them to dictate long enough for them to feel that I have valued and loved them um, and then uh, find some way to wrap it up. Um, and Deben moves through along. Second issue is that most of the time when someone engages me in a conversation on freedom of conscience, it's not about freedom of conscience. To me, freedom of conscience is my, um, those in power granting me uh, the ability to say no to what they dictate I ought to do uh, because to do so uh, would violate what I know to be right. That's freedom of conscience, at least in my understanding of it, and we may flesh that out a bit tonight. Most of the time, somebody starts off with something that sounds like freedom of conscience and we end up talking about physician autonomy and, and how physicians need to be empowered to make good choices and have boundaries and do work-life balance well. That's an important discussion, it's a different discussion. Or we get into the morality of whatever it is they can't believe a doctor's not doing, like contraception or abortion or euthanasia, which again are important discussions, but are not discussions about freedom of conscience. Um, occasionally, it's about power and how those who have power have wounded the person I'm engaged in dialogue with. Uh, and a discussion you thought about, what you thought was about freedom of conscience, turns to be out, of, out rape, or something that, that you had no idea that was where that was actually coming from. So when someone says, can you believe that those three doctors in Ottawa won't prescribe the pill? My first thought is to get to where that's coming from. So, what should you do with freedom of conscience? Maybe if they actually want a dialogue about freedom of conscience, you can get somewhere. Um, 
but pay very careful attention to what they're actu what's actually behind the questions. Uh, and you may discover that actually it's not about freedom of conscience at all. And if you end up doing a five minute dictate about freedom of conscience and they do a five minute dictate about how those in power ought to respect those who are powerless, uh, at the end of the encounter, neither one of you will have achieved very much, but you both feel pretty good, um, which I suppose is a, an accomplishment. Thanks. <laughs> Quickly pull out some notes here. Um, seeing that I had eight minutes, I figured that I should probably refer to some notes. Uh, so, Dan, you shared very big picture. I'm going to narrow in for uh, dentistry and just focus in on the difference that dentistry has versus Christian physicians with respect to ethics. And although I think there are numerous ethical challenges that are similar, I think that probably the, the best thing for me to do tonight might be to share on business ethics. So although dentistry is very much rooted in healthcare, it is still very much a business. Like any Christian business, the business owner needs to have a good understanding of how to remain profitable without compromising their integrity. And the health of a dental business, either positively or negatively, impacts on the provision of dental care to its patients. So some of the factors, when I was trying to think about the ethical implications for dentists, some of the factors that came to my mind were the fact that most dental office overheads are around 70%, which might come as a big surprise for the physicians in the room. Rarely does it drop below 65%, and more often it is much higher than 70%, especially in offices where there's behavioral issues. Uh, the other thing, too, is dental students are graduating with tremendous uh, amounts of, of student-related debt. Uh, I was talking to one dental grad that just graduated, and she's graduating with close to $400,000 in student-related uh, debt. And that's not having bought a home. There's no personal expenses included in that. There's no home that's been purchased. There's no car that's been purchased. Um, so that's, and that isn't even including a, a business. She hasn't purchased a practice. She's just graduating with almost 400000 in, in in debt setting up uh, just one dental op or one dental treatment room, it can easily be $100,000. So uh, if you can think about your dental office experiences, there's, there's definitely a high overhead that, that's associated. The other thing, too, that I find uh, is lifestyle expectations that are unrealistic. I find that that's a, definitely a factor that can compromise dental um, business, uh, dentist business ethics. And it can be the dentist themselves, it can be their spouse, it can be their family, it could be their extended family, um, or all of the above that, that can impact on those unrealistic expectations. And unfortunately, banks are very good at lending money to dentists, and so we can easily find ourselves into those situations that um, are hard to get out of. The other thing, too, that's very prominent in dentistry, especially in the urban centers, is uh, high business competition. So uh, the number of patients per dentist will drop in a, in a urban area, so it's very hard to keep that schedule booked while the overhead clock is ticking. And many of you in the urban areas can think about how many dental offices that are springing up all over the place. The other thing, too, with the business downturn or the economic downturn that's happened, there's a lot of dentists that are not retiring. They're working much longer than was expected. And so these new grads um, are not finding opportunities to come in. And so that's a, definitely been an impact. Uh, the concentration of dentists in urban areas has, has gone up. And the last point that I wanted to bring up was that dental students and dentists in general have very poor understanding of business practice, management practices. There's very few DDS MBA degrees, uh, combined degrees, and it, you know, dentistry, like I said, it is very much rooted in healthcare, but it is also very much a business. And so, um, many dental offices generate more money than small businesses do, and yet most dentists don't have those skills and are not taught those. So dentists find themselves pressured to the point where they feel that they must resort to prescribing more lucrative treatment um, and also maybe questionable treatment, unnecessary treatment. Overbilling can become an issue and in extreme cases would be defrauding insurance companies. So changing dates or 
just in general, just things that would be considered fraud. And despite the Bible being really clear about instruction on good stewardship and living with integrity, some Christian dentists find themselves in the same compromising situations as non-Christians. And another factor is that contributes to dental professional issues is that many dentists feel that they cannot reach out to their peers for support. And they, this worsens the stress and the shame that's related to financial trouble. And this can result in burnout, substance abuse, and very much negative uh, family relationships, which in turn increases stress and shame. So one of the things that I think is great is that scripture leads us to the best way to live and that God does intend for us to live in community with other believers and that there is strength in community. And that's one thing very much that I very much appreciate about CMDS is this community that we experience in these, in these national conferences. And when dentists are firmly rooted in scripture's warnings and recommendations, we're free to live without the burden of ethical compromise. And so two areas that I feel that are very supportive for dentists to avoid the pitfalls is membership, or mentorship, sorry, um, and also membership. Membership in organizations such as CMDS, where there is the opportunity to be safe, to discuss the realities of business life for Christian professionals. So that's what I wanted to share tonight. Eight minutes is not long enough, as you well know. Um, <laughs> but I want to just point out three or four things, because I think getting to questions as soon as possible is probably the best thing we can do. And I spend my life interacting with people at that level. So most people get into trouble because they don't ask the right questions of themselves before they start asking questions of others. And the key questions to ask, first of all, is help. Uh, when uh, Nehemiah was going to speak to the king, he found time to say help before he said what he said. And when you're in a tough situation, it's always good to start that way. In practice, you want to know, you want to be thinking, what are they assuming to be true? And can I show that it's a false assumption? Because that's going to be very powerful if you can do it. Secondly, you must ask, what definitions are they using? Uh, we don't do enough of that. And only after that do you start putting together the questions in a sequence that will work. Let me just illustrate very briefly, and then we can turn to questions and you can, you can move on. The, the liberal elite who rule us assume that freedom means freedom of choice. Now, those of you who are at my seminar this morning know that it takes me rather longer than 30 seconds to get through what's on in what's involved in that concept. But at least go home and work out if you could explain to your church the difference between freedom from and freedom for. You see, for a Christian, becoming a Christian gives you the freedom to live as you ought. For a libertarian, freedom is the freedom to allow me to live as I want. Those are entirely different societies. The liberal elite who rule us know nothing of our definition, uh, and they have not thought about the impact of theirs. And it's our fault. So they are making assumptions. Usually the assumption is wrong, as Lewis pointed out a long while ago, not because it's intrinsically wrong, so much as because it disorders good things. Um, that's all that's necessary. So what the libertarian has done is taken the good idea of choice and put it above the better idea of truth. And so they suppress truth in the process. Now, all of these things you can obviously can unpack, be unpacked a, a lot more. The other thing is, are you aware that, there are, that you must th be thinking in at least two categories when the word conscience comes up? How many of you are not aware? How many of you are aware? So 95% of you are asleep. <laughs> Let's try again. 
<laughs> no, no, but it's very important to be willing to say, I don't know in public. I don't know. Well, that, that's, how many of you don't know? How many of you could not? That's a, at least it's worth talking to the 10% of you who are awake. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's not a small thing. The ancients had two words for conscience. The last pope uh, suggested we should have a third to set, rather than the one that was second before. Conscience comes from the Latin word conscientious, con conscientia. Uh, and that is feelings about right and wrong. It is subjective. The more important word for the Greeks was syndoresis, which Benedict suggested anamnesis would be a better word. That is moral thought. Most of the time, when you are having an argument about conscience, you are dealing with the other person's feelings, not their thoughts. So your first job is to get that sorted out and then to ask them which it is. And that's not easy to do. You've got to do, you better do some work, because this is not unimportant. Uh, we can go into that uh, a little bit more uh, as the evening goes on. The book I would recommend as a starter would be J. Budyshevsky's What We Can't Not Know, because he deals with it quite well in that. You can also find a nice discussion of conscience very briefly in one page on Peter Kreeft's website. That's K-R-E-E-F-T. But those are the issues you've got to sort out. And now the final thing, because I must send you home as physicians with something very practical to do. I think CMDS actually should create one of those triangular things that you can put on your desk so that you can have a message, normally your name facing the patient, right? I suggest you do away with your name and you have this put on a, a piece of triangular wood or whatever it is. Do you wish to be cared for by a doctor with or without moral integrity? <laughs> because what the liberal elite are not recognizing is that they wish to produce doctors who either purloin their integrity and therefore don't have it, or people who are not people, because it is your moral integrity that is a central feature of your identity. These are faceless people who are taking over. And we must point out that they are faceless and meaningless, uh, and that where they're taking us is a desert. Thank you very much. We had, uh, we had a very interesting uh, time at the Western Student Retreat. And uh, a, a professor by the name of Far Curlin, who is also a, a physician, uh, came and spoke to the Western Student Retreat about the issue of conscience. And Far said something that I, it really stuck with me. He said, my concern is that we're framing this in a way uh, uh, where it's going to be very hard for us to win this battle. But uh, Farr suggested that we should think of it in terms of, I became uh, a doctor or a dentist to heal people. And in very, so in very simple terms, what I intend to do in my work is heal people. So things that the, the state or others, the libertarians are asking me to do, such as, you know, uh, refer for abortion or... Uh, or uh, uh, physician-assisted suicide, these are things that are not going to bring about healing. So this is simply not my job. And uh, what uh, you, you see, one benefit that you have from a legal perspective is that you, uh, you do have, as physicians, you do have the right to be able to say, I don't want to do a certain procedure. And the reason for the law giving you that right is that the, nobody wants to force you to do something that you're not going to be good at because you don't really want to do it. So as long as you have that, then you're able to say, uh, look, these are the boundaries of what I'm prepared to do to heal patients. But if you ask me to do something that's against their best interest, I don't want to be involved. So I thought Farr's approach to that was a really good one. Yeah, I've known Farr for many years. I Met him when he was a student in Chicago. Yeah. Um, he's a great guy and he's doing a good job. Yeah, wonderful. Let me just give you an example of how it works. Some of you remember, and I've now forgotten his name. Sheila will remember. And immediately he was the student who got into trouble in uh, Manitoba. What was his name? Cameron Pierce. Sorry? Cameron Pierce. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, 
I, I've been saying to students for some time that you will be asked to do things which are against your moral integrity. And I suggest you learn to handle it in this way. Don't say no as a first response. When somebody asks you to do something who's, in, who's above you in the hierarchy, you don't want to antagonize them unnecessarily. That's stupid. Say, before I obey you, may I ask you a question? And that's when you use, do you wish to be cared for, your family to be cared for by a doctor with or without moral integrity? They're bound to say with. And then you can say, I know that this issue is not a, a moral issue for you, but it is for me. If you make me do this, which you have the power to do, at least initially, <coughs> you will diminish me as a person and as a physician for the rest of my life. Do you want to do that? How many people would say yes? <laughs> if they did and you were recording it, which you should, <laughs> put that on YouTube, they'd lose their job. We can win this one. And we must frame the argument this way. And the other thing, the other point to make out in this, this is not an issue of medicine. This is to be framed as an issue of justice and an, as an issue of dem democracy. There are just, in fact, more people out there who wish to be cared for people with our set of moral ideas of rectitude than the other side who have no ideas of moral rectitude except I want to do what I want to do. That's a pretty limited society. Uh, we have a, a daughter who uh, has, is just about to have her ninth baby. Um, the, the man who delivered her first few babies started doing abortions. Do you think she wanted to go on having him deliver her babies? And isn't that a perfectly reasonable response of a woman? I don't want, frankly, a man who's prepared to kill babies on one floor to deliver me, my baby on the next. You don't know what he's going to do. Hippocrates understood that. A doctor who does not fear judgment after death is going to be feared by everybody else if we legalize physician-assisted killing, for instance. So we've got to be able to make this argument. Let's uh, take some questions from the floor or some comments. Yeah, would you like to just stand and if you could raise your voice so we can hear. For the record, um, that is a, a, a professor expressing an opinion. Uh, if it was cardiology, you could say what level of evidence uh, backs your opinion that drug A is good for drug for treatment of condition X. Uh, and he would have to say, uh, that's expert opinion, and I think I'm an expert, uh, or that's based on whatever. Um, for whatever reason in ethics, none of that, people get up and express opinions um, like their law. Um, the, the first place to start is to connect to something like this where you can say, uh, I, I wasn't aware that there's any case law which uh, gives us an obligation um, to, what, to what case law are you referring, right? And they don't say that it's law. <coughs> moral obligation, yes, moral obligation. Uh -huh. And again, it, so I guess my only thought, I, I hear this all the time, every time I hear a student say it, I will convey to them that there is, that whether there is a legal obligation remains a point of contention, moral obligation even more so, um, and don't take every, everything that professors say uh, in ethics uh, is just as contestable as everything they say in cardiology, um, but it's a little harder to challenge. The, the key document there is the statement of, and Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the key document is the statement of the Ontario uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons. Well, it depends on your province. So again, if, as you run oh, yeah. into these things, rely on us. Uh, I can give you lots of documentation and, and John can give you lots of, um, of uh, other useful things and you'll get four or five different responses from different people and different angles. Um, so the, the CMA uh, remains committed to there is not an obligation to refer. Um, each, there is no college in uh, uh, any province which uh, says that you have an obligation to refer except for Quebec, uh, which says if you say, oh, by the way, you can Google this, you've satisfied your obligation to refer which isn't usually what family doctors think of when somebody says you have to refer. Um, but that is what the, and part of the other murkiness 
which is why you have to ask really good questions. If somebody says, yes, do, do you need to ref an obligation to refer? Can you define obligation? From whence does obligations arise? Can you define refer? What do you mean by that? Um, and part of, the, part of the mess is that we get into arguments, as John says, without defining terms, and what they mean by obligation is not what you mean, and what they mean even by refer is not what you mean. Um, so every truth claim somebody makes, before I can even begin to engage the truth claim, I usually have to go through a word by word dissection to determine what they mean by each word, other than usually uh, two, uh, although even that sometimes. Obligation to refer, the only thing that, that I need, I, that I don't need you to define is two. <laughs> the, the first thing to say, of course, is do you not know that a DMC can be done for other reasons than taking the baby out? Uh, and if you do uh, gynae, you will do that. You don't need to have done it. And as far as both killing patients and abortion is concerned, it wouldn't, you don't need to go to medical school to learn the skills in many parts of the world. It's done by people who have not done that. I suggest lawyers and social activists should do both of them. Yeah, the, uh, I, just, I just wanted to flag something for you, is that what confuses this is lawyers poke their nose into this. And uh, a good example is the policy on the effect of the Human Rights Act that the Ontario College of Physicians and Sur Surgeons adopted. Uh, and there are some human rights commissions, and I hope you understand that many human rights commissions are completely off the wall. They don't get uh, challenged enough in court, and most people just accept what they say. But the Ontario <coughs> Human Rights Commission approached the college and said, we want the, the, all the, uh, the policies of the college to conform to the Human Rights Act. And, and there are some people, some lawyers, who would propose that it is discriminating against women if you don't allow them to have an abortion that that is somehow sexual discrimination, okay? And that, I actually got that one time. I contacted the Human Rights Commission in Nova Scotia. I said, my wife is a family doctor. She does not want to refer for abortion. And, they, and the response was from someone from the Human Rights Commission, that is wrong, that's discriminatory. She's discriminating against women because they have the right to be in the same uh, situation as men do. So, uh, yeah. So, so this, is, this, this is the problem, and this is why this is so ambiguous in your various universities, because uh, the ethics people I've spoken to don't have a good, the one I spoke to about this didn't have a good understanding of what the college has said, uh, had never heard anything other than what she had heard from an, from an activist that we have in Halifax who perceives herself to be an expert on this. And so she's going around telling everyone, yes, there's a duty to refer, and because she's a law professor, everyone believes exactly what she says, okay? And so you have to uh, recognize that and be aware of it. But the problem is, is that these people who are uh, in power in these positions, then go around and write articles which are, as Dan said, they're just dictating. There's no reason, there's no, there's no attempt to try to convince you of their position, they're just telling you what you must do. And it's very directive and anti-democratic, and, 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 and this is what my son was up against this week in his, in his ethics class, but he turned the tables miraculously, we were all praying for him. And he started talking about his perspective, sharing his view on this and his feelings about this with his classmates. And at the end of their discussion, two or three of his classmates said, you know, this was a good discussion, but only because George was here to express the other side. And they said, the materials for this course are biased, and we're gonna put that in our evaluation. Okay? But, but unless there is a George, there's no discussion. So we, and George was so upset about potentially getting in a conflict with his classmates and with his professors that this was extremely hard for him to do, but I'm proud to say he did it. And I think, in my view, this is the whole problem, that we, all of us, are shying away from the conflict. I think we need to get out there and express it. 
can I make one comment further? This also illustrates the point about asking where it all began. I give a regular lecture on abortion. I've done it from Harvard to Oxford to all over the world in a secular setting. On more than one occasion, Planned Parenthood has called an emergency meeting afterwards. <laughs> and the question you need to ask is, what would you need to believe for abortion to be ethical? And what would you need to believe for it to be unethical? And what are the consequences of those two positions? Now, that takes an hour to get through. If you want to listen to it, you can get it from Augustine College. Uh, it has an innocuous title like Pursuing Justice for the Unborn. But it's an hour CD actually recorded in the University of Minnesota with Planned Parenthood in the audience, and they did call an emergency meeting afterwards. I've never had a single aggressive question at the end of that lecture. Not one. Another question. Well, that's a, that's a really important point, and I think that you've raised an issue that deals with, the, with really a, a very fundamental question is, what, what are you doing and uh, who are you serving? I think is a really important question. It's interesting, one of our board members said to me, she said, I feel like my patients treat me exactly with the same level of respect that they treat their hairstylist. The only difference is they don't give me tips. <laughs> Dan, Dan, would you like to talk about that? Not the, not the, not the hairstylist part. <laughs> yes. Um, it, it's, it's not about freedom of conscience. It's about what's a doctor and what does a doctor do and what do we expect doctors to do. And that's a very big, broad discussion, um, which isn't a discussion of freedom of conscience. Um, and I think... It, uh, society is a bit conflicted uh, in what they want of us. Uh, some of the time they want us to do uh, what they tell us to do and sometimes they want us uh, to make informed judgments and sometimes they want to be taken care of. Um, and there's this bizarre expectation that you can be all those three things um, when you can't. You can't be all of those three things. Um, and I think it, it may be difficult in Emerge but it we, we need to start having those discussions with patients, right? You've come in uh, for me to do this for you. Uh, I see medicine as the task of, of acting in what's in your best interest. Um, and I think that's what you expect doctors to do. I don't think this is in your best interest and, and my task is to act in your best interest and so I'm not the person that can do this for you, right? And, and again, if it's, if it's framed in the, in the best interest, um, then it's not about freedom of conscience. It's not about, yeah, I think this would be really good for you, but I find it morally objectionable and therefore I'm not going to, right? That, I don't think you can win that one. Um, I think you, you, and if the, um, Emerge is a bit of an interesting place because a great number of people coming through um, actually don't want you to act in their best interest because that will get in the way of why they've arrived in your Emerge. Um, <laughs> I have no wisdom there, I avoid a merge. I, I just wanted to, John, if you don't mind, I'm just gonna ask Karina, because I wanna get her involved in this discussion. Do you ever have situations, Karina, where patients ask you to do things that you're not comfortable with and you have to say no? Yes, dentistry does have that big picture issue as well, and a lot of it does have to do with business-related things. Lots of patients want insurance to be backdated so that they, you know, have their procedures done or billed under a different, maybe child or something like that. If there's a limit, but we have had patients that definitely have wanted to have a certain type of treatment and. We just don't think that's in their best interest. And we've just very gently had that conversation with them and said that, you know, it would be best for you to find somebody that would be willing to do that for you and no hard feelings. And, you know, they, we haven't had any, fortunately, we haven't had any irate patients or if they were, they, were, they, they left and <laughs> we didn't have to deal with them anymore. But yeah. yes. Yeah. It does come down to conscience in one way because think of the Nazis. Everything that they did to the Jews was legal. When someone says, because these are what you are legally supposed to do, that does not make them right. 
that would mean they're written in stone and can't be changed. The worst legislation in America was the Dred Scott affair. It turned black people into things. We, we have got to be able to point out that autonomy and legality are good things, but they must be under truth. And what is being forbidden at this case is a discussion of what the truth of the matter is. When you have that, you win. Uh, I think we can only, we're running short of time. Uh, we can only take one more question. How about uh, Stephen at the back? I could have paid you for that question. <laughs> I, this is exactly the point, and people have been making this point since the mid-70s that we are losing the moral consensus that underpins our society. And medicine is essentially not a technical or scientific activity, but a moral one. Because every patient who comes into you, do they have to take your advice? They do not. Therefore, what you actually do, and Hippocrates understood this, is you help patients to decide what they ought to do. Now, there are no oughts in science. Science cannot provide you with any oughts. That only comes from metaphysical, the metaphysical world, not the physical world. <coughs> now, you've got to be able to make this case. It's not difficult to learn. Uh, but once you've acknowledged that, we, we are a pluralistic society with incommensurable ideas. Not everything can be fudged in the nice Canadian way. Some things are actually totally opposed to one another. And we've got to learn to live with one another. Tolerance is not a virtue, it's a means to deal with these problems. And we're going to need several practices of medicine. We were stupid to close the Salvation Army hospitals. Uh, hopefully we won't close the Catholic ones. We are going to need to practice medicine under a moral rubric because it is a moral activity. Now, the elite who rule us don't want to engage with this, so it's our job to force them to engage with it. Where do you get your ideas of ought from? By what authority do you say this? Now, those of you who were in my morning session, you can go to sleep for 15 seconds. But the best paragraph I know in the world on this was written by an atheist, and that is perfect. Always collect atheists who speak the truth. Uh, it's a man called Arthur Leff, and this is him thinking about what happens when you don't have transcendence in your world. He taught common law at Yale for many years. He gave this talk at Duke in 1979. So you can find it in the Duke Law Review for 1979, Leff on Justice. But he opens thus. He says, I want to believe, and so do you, in a complete, transcendent, and immanent set of propositions about right and wrong, findable rules that direct us as to how to live our lives righteously. He was an unbelieving Jew. He wanted Torah to be true and from God, because if it doesn't come from God, where does the law come from? The judge, if he doesn't believe in God, will make judgments that suit his subset, his clan, ultimately. Beverly McLaughlin is a good example. But Leff goes on, he's honest, he says, I also want to believe, and so do you, in no such thing as a God-given law, but rather that we are wholly free to decide for ourselves what we ought to do and what we ought to be. What we want, heaven help us, is to be per perfectly ruled and perfectly free. That is at the same time to discover the right and the good and to invent it. They are inventing good. We discover good by the grace of God. Those are two different worlds. And when you lay out the consequences, even the pro-choice feminists, when I finish my lecture on abortion, it always ends the same way. I have laid out two worlds for you. Which one do you want to give to your children? It's our world they want for their children, not theirs. Thanks. Question. The, the way I, I mean, we're going to have a session on euthanasia tomorrow, uh, but the way I always answer that is uh, people uh, always think about a perfect world in which someone who uh, someone is justified in having euthanasia 
gets to get have it. Like pe people will look at Gloria Taylor, for instance, from BC, and they'll say, oh, poor soul. I don't personally agree with euthanasia, but if poor Gloria Taylor is suffering you know, unbearably, let her go, you know? But what they don't realize is that once we legalize uh, physician-assisted suicide for Gloria Taylor, we also open the door for physician-assisted suicide for a whole category of people, and it is acknowledged even by the proponents of physician-assisted suicide that there is a risk risk of uh, uh, wrongful death. So when we allow it for one, then we must allow it for a whole category of people, and it puts all of us, every one of us, at risk of wrongful death. And all you have to do is look at the statistics from the various jurisdictions to see that. So in a sense, it's, it's like a wish that people have that really they don't understand because they're opening Pandora's box, and it affects all the people in the room. At, any suggestion that this is only for people who uh, want it, all you have to do is look at the jurisdictions, the permissive jurisdictions like Belgium and Holland, and you'll see that it's now so widespread that there really are no protections for people. So that's the way I, I answer that in terms of helping people. I think also we have a role to play in terms of, in all of our Christian communities, reminding people about what God said about human life and what Jesus says about human life. And somehow, in all of our denominations, the whole idea of a moral law given by God that we need to obey for our own good has been lost. We're, we, the, the society has come in underneath all of our faith and is subtly eroding all of these building blocks of our faith. And the erosion is, you are God. You should be able to determine your own destiny. And everything in our society drives us towards that individualism. And so we then forget about our brothers and sisters who are in need. And we then forget about a proper relationship with God our Father. So these are critical, important points that need to be shared. Uh, just as we uh, wrap up, the, the last comment came from John. I'm going to ask uh, Dan if... Okay. Two, two thoughts, I guess. One is you asked how we engage the public. Um, the public is a rather amorphous group. Um, and I think if, if you've got in your head, uh, on this topic, uh, I will approach it this way, um, you're gonna miss almost always. Um, I'm told that uh, a good Lutheran, when you ask them a question, will respond with, why do you ask? Which seems an extremely uh, good way to start the conversation, right? So your friend is coming from a very specific place, a very specific set of fears, um, and if she accepts scripture as God's inspired word, then there's a, there's a conversation that is open to you, um, which if she has the same set of fears but doesn't accept scripture, it's a different conversation. And if it's actually just a, a theoretical question, it's a different thing. Uh, and so how do I address the public? It, if, I'm, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. then I want to know an awful lot about you. And if it's one-on-five, I want to know an awful lot about the five. And if it's a room like this, I want to know an awful lot about all of you. Um, because there's the, the public is not, is this amorphous thing that, um, the other story is told that, that um, again, um, a rabbi, unfortunately I've forgotten his name, apparently he's quite famous. Uh, somebody got very upset with him once and said, you rabbis, all you ever do is answer questions with questions. Uh, and he thought for a moment and said, well, what's wrong with a question? Um, <laughs> and, and so far you don't get in trouble asking questions. Uh, and the, but the key thing about the questions, you get to know the other person to figure out what this conversation is about. It sounds like for your friend, this conversation may be about Her fear. trusting God and, and fear, and God let cancer happen to me, and I've survived, and that, again, is not, a content, is not a freedom of conscience. And if you end up launching into a dictate about freedom of conscience, or launching into a dictate about why it's ridiculous that any Christian uh, would think this way, you're gonna completely miss an incredibly important conversation that yeah. this person might be seeking to have. It's really a pastoral opportunity, isn't it? It's yeah. an opportunity. Pastoral uh, or counseling. Or counseling or, yes, to listen yes. to someone and find out what is at the root cause. Mm. And yeah. you can do that with a group of 200 people too. Uh, if you take the time to get to know where's that crowd coming from. Uh, now, uh, Karina's had the least to say, if you notice. So I wanna give the last word to you. 
Um, did you have anything particular that you'd like to? <laughs> No, I, I do want to encourage everyone that is here to reach out to other um, physicians and dentists and let them know about the benefit of being in community. It is, um, it is very valuable, and so let, let them know. Take that step of courage to, to let them know to, to make effort to be connected. And also, for those that are in need of mentorship, if you're able to do that, mentor them, help them. Um, let them know that they're not alone. Let them know that they can reach out and, and find a safe place. And uh, I think it's great that we have the opportunity to share thoughts with each other, especially because medicine and, and uh, dentistry tends to be a little bit different. It's very nice to be able to sit at tables with other people and discuss how important God is as part of our foundation of our profession. So that's all I have to say. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. I think they've... It's, uh, it's been an in extremely insightful uh, discussion. You know, I, when I think of conscientious objection, I think of the Hebrew midwives who stood up to Pharaoh. And uh, I guess uh, we, we can think about the tremendous courage that they had. Um, but it's awfully hard for us, uh, and I include myself in this, to actually uh, poke our heads up out of the foxhole and feel like we can be a target in our own profession. I know, uh, at, you know, I, I was very proud of my wife and my son when we went to the CMA meetings, consultation on physician-assisted suicide. But because I love them so much, I could see the agony they were going through at actually having to stand up in front of their peers and uh, really express their opinion on this very controversial topic. So we need to have the courage of the Hebrew midwives, uh, and, but we also need to realize how difficult it is without being part of the community. Uh, I think uh, we're so fortunate to have John's strength and the, and the uh, vigor and courage that he has. We are also very blessed uh, to have uh, Dan as well because of his sensitivity to the needs of people he's dialoguing with. And uh, somehow, if we could exercise both of these great charisms and, uh, and be as uh, gentle and as diplomatic as Karina, we'd, be, uh, we'd have a perfect uh, CMDS society. <laughs> anyway.